so thank you thank you for the introduction and good evening everybody uh, so uh, in building up on what farooq said ship building and ship repair is an industry that has flourished in the city of mumbai for nearly 3 centuries and continues to do so even to this day <coughs> what initially started with the building of small sailing vessels has now evolved into building of modern state of the art warships and submarines and since the early 18th century 1736 to be exact more than 600 vessels ships platforms of various descriptions have been constructed at mumbai uh, uh, which is a record of sorts so beyond those imposing walls of the masgon dock ship builders limited and the naval dockyard mumbai have been 600 vessels have been built and sent all over the world we shall be talking about that in today's talk the advent of the steam engine to propel ships resulted in the first paradigm shift of ship building in bombay uh, now mumbai but at times i will be referring to the city of mumbai as bombay as it was known at the, that time and also there were certain geo, major geopolitical ramifications of uh, certain activities that happened so ship building and methodology and technology has sin since undergone multiple evolutions from the steam engines to the ultra modern gas turbine technology of today and this talk will cover the period of building from the first steamship in mumbai to the modern warships and submarines of today okay. mumbai is a city which has always been closely linked to the uh, sea the crest of the bmc or the municipal corporation of greater mumbai depicts three ships and the statue outside of the mumbai headquarters the bmc headquarters shows a figure with a ship in a hand which is in sort of way acknowledges the closeness or the importance the sea and the natural harbor that mumbai is blessed with has to the city to the development of the city now just a short recap to put things into context a bulk of india's trade is through the sea and amounts to 90% by of trade by volume and 70% by value india sits at the center of the indian ocean and a natural pivot and has a rich maritime history dating to over 4 millennia you see those red arrows they are those are the monsoon winds the in the era of sail they were very very significant and also played a, a minor role in the later part in the 19th century and this map shows the bay roughly the eastern seaboard of the city now what was so attractive was that this portion in blue is a very natural harbor uh, right extending from the gateway of india to roughly wadala this was the natural harbor and this was what attracted most of the europeans to the city of mumbai there were of course various other factors also but this was one of the primary factors which uh, uh, the europeans came to mumbai because of the safe and natural harbor which is protected uh, self uh, provided a self uh, safe anchorage from three sides and there were shows were adaptable for landing of vessels for repairs and careening now uh, just for the non mariners here uh, ships are classified mainly by their tonnage or the size of the ship we have all heard of archimedes principle i just i shall be using this term a lot so i'll just explain what is the tonnage of a ship a, sh uh, a ship due to its shape displaces some amount of water so when i say a ship of uh, say 500 tons it means that the ship displaces that amount 500 tons of water this displaced water in turns acts as a buoyant force it exerts a buoyant force on the hull of the ship thus keeping the ship floating in water although it may be constructed of a uh, material which is denser than water like iron or steel so i shall be using this term quite frequently in this talk so just so that we are on the same page this is what ton tonnage of a ship means the bigger the ship the more the tonnage ship building activity since the 18th century was carried out at the bombay dockyard you know uh, this is what the bombay dockyard looks like it is now of course the naval dockyard but in the 18th and 19th century the bombay dockyard comprised what is today the naval dockyard and what is today the masgon dock ship builders limited together they formed the bombay dockyard and that is where the ship building 
ship repair and ship uh, refitting activity used to mainly take place since 1736. This is some of the infrastructure which lies beyond those imposing walls. This is the up Bombay dock. The upper Bombay dock was uh, built in 1750, which was followed by the middle Bombay dock and the lower old Bombay dock in 1765. So the upper, the image on the top shows the painting of that era. And the photograph at the bottom shows what the Bombay dock is looks like today. It is still in use since 1750. We have the Mazgon dock which was a dock which was built in 1774 at Mazgon. And needless to say that this dock is also in use even in, in the present day. There is a Duncan dock which was built in 1807 that also lies in the naval dockyard. And these this dock too is used for modern warships of the day. Now, in addition to these well-known docks, there is also another piece of infrastructure which is known as the Mughal Dock. The Mughal Dock was a privately owned dock in the 19th century and it was owned by the, by the Sheikh of Mukala, who was also a Nawab of Hyderabad. Now, Mukala is a, is a province in Yemen in near Aden. So, this Sheikh of Mukala owned the Mughal Dock and the Mughal Dock was used for the maintenance of trading dhows which were trading into the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, Zanzibar, that sort of thing. Records show that in 1843, it was owned by a merchant by the name of Mohammed Rahim Shirazi. And this dock was later acquired by the P&O Steam Navigation Company in 1854. But this existed well into the early uh, 19th century and was used for ship repair activities. Another dock which lies at Mazgon Dock Shipbuilders is the Ritchie Dock which was built in 1865 and was part of the P&O yard. What is the P&O? I will be covering a bit later. So this is roughly the infrastructure of dry docks used for shipbuilding, which lie in the Bombay dockyard. Now coming on to ships, the first vessel to be propelled by steam in India was a river boat owned by the Nawab of Oud at Lucknow around 1890. It was a very, very small vessel which was mainly used as a pleasure craft in the river Gomti. The first steamer to be built in India was the Diana, which was built for a private merchant uh, engaged in the Canton trade. She was built at Calcutta in 1822. And the first steamship or the steamer to be built at Bombay was in 1829. It was the HCS Hugh Lindsay. Uh, HCS stands for Honorable Company Service, which was a ship built for the East India Company's use. It displaced, it displaced around 411 tons and was powered by two 80 uh, horsepower engines. Now, the HCS Hugh Lindsay sailed from Bombay to Suez and completed the maiden voyage in 21 days. The return voyage took 19 days and uh, 14, hour, 14 odd hours. Why is this significant? This has established the feasibility of running steamers between Bombay and Suez, and that set into motion a certain activities which had big geopolitical ramifications later on in the day. Before 1830, the primary route from England to India involved a four to six month sail round Africa via the Cape of Good Hope in sailing ships. Now, the journey usually took more closer to six months than four months, depending upon winds, weather, ships, tides, port conditions. And it was very difficult to get a passage from England because the you had to look for a passage on one of the cargo ships coming to from England to India. Also, those monsoon winds, which we saw in the earlier uh, graphic, those red arrows, made it easier for sailing ship to reach Calcutta and to Bombay. Because once you round the Cape of uh, Cape of Good Hope, you could go sail to Calcutta easily, uh, thanks to those winds. Now, steam, with the, uh, with the advent of steam-powered ship, Bombay enjoyed the shorter distance to Europe. How, we shall see. So, the, in 1830, the East India Company pioneered the Red Sea route with the HCS Hugh Lindsay. By 1835, the East India Company sends its mail via the overland route through Egypt. Now, this is this shows the overland route, the overland portion involving an 84-mile journey 
across the desert and tiny paddle steamers and barges from Cairo to Alexandra. So you have to go through the Gulf of Aden, you have to cro cross overland 84 miles and reach the Mediterranean Sea and embark another ship from there which will take you to England and vice versa. So this this uh, this particular development uh, reduced the average journey time from India to Britain and Britain to India from six months to two months. Drastically, it came down by one third. And this slide shows the comparison of the two distances. By 1840, the Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company won the Bombay contract and three years later began a service from Calcutta as well. So the P&O company started a regular service this resulted in Bombay becoming the gateway to India. And since then, it has continued to be the business capital and the gateway to India since that because of this particular development. Or one of them, I would say. Now, early steamships were a combination of sail and steam. Immediately, you did not just um, transition from a sail ship to a steamship. Early steamships were a combination. It was a hybrid, hybrid uh, I would say, construction. They employed paddles for propulsion. The propeller wasn't in use as now. So they used steam paddles on the side of the ships. Introduction of steam navigation did not mean immediate end of sailing ships. Early steam ships were hybrids, as you can see. But they did not have much endurance and needed coal uh, replenishment at frequent intervals. Therefore, the commercial viability of steam came only when uh, the engines were greatly improved, the efficiency improved, and the uh, the capacity of the ships improved and then the ships started being made constructed of iron and then of steel otherwise the early early steamships were had wooden hulls which were not very sturdy now since the building of the u lindsay about 60 steamships were built at the bombay dockyard this is a report from the publication in england called the atlas of 1839 that reports the launch of an iron steamer named comet at masgon for use in the Indus River. I hope everybody can read the newspaper report. Another extract is from a publication called the Allen's Indian Mail of 1846, which reports the launching of a steamer called Sir Charles, Charles Forbes at Masgon in 1846. They were all widely reported in the newspapers as they are reported, uh, reported even today. Allen's Indian Mail of 1848 reports the launching of a BISN company steamer, the George Russell Clerk, again at Masgon. So BISN was another company which I will be covering later on. So we come to the P and O company. So in 1822, Brody Maggie Wilcox, a London ship broker, and Arthur Anderson, who you see in the image, a sailor from the Shetland Isles, went into partnership and started a shipping company, primarily operating routes between England. Spain and Portugal or the Iberian Peninsula and they call the company the Peninsula Steam Navigation Company which was the parent company of the P&O line. Now this developed into a Peninsula and Oriental Steam Navigation Company which was registered in 1836. Initial operations of the company were based out of Calcutta. In 1840 the P&O won a contract to take over the packet service from Suez to England hitherto run by the Admiralty or the Royal Navy and the steam route. So in 1840, they had backed the rights to run the steam route or the overland route, which we have just seen in the previous slides. And between 1840 and 1872, virtually all communication between Britain, India, China, Japan and Australia was, uh, was in the hands of the P&O company. The crest, if you see the P&O company's crest shows an elephant, a dragon, a kangaroo and a lion representing these companies, uh, these countries. And the P&O office was in Leadenhall Street in London. This was a very prime piece of real estate. The head office of the East India Company was also located on the same street. And this shows some uh, P&O ships, the SS Indus and SS Ripon in the early days. You can see they are a combination of steam and uh, sailing ships and a crew on board a P&O ship. So we move on. In 1850, the P&O had, uh, had a virtual monopoly over here of the, uh, of the sailing services, of the passenger services, of the mail packets. 
and they started scouting around for proper repair and maintenance base at bombay because the volume of traffic was very large in 1854 the mogul dry dock which we have seen was acquired by the p and o company and the dry dock served as a requirement to provide the new mail service uh, maintenance facilities later on they also acquired the masgon portion of the bombay dockyard so what is in masgon part of the bombay dockyard was acquired by the p and o company uh, which and uh, this together came to be known as the p and o company's dockyard at masgon so many old maps will refer to this as the p and o dockyard what is today masgon dock shipbuilders limited a public sector uh, company was was known as the p and o company's dockyard at masgon this in 1870 the p and o company vacated the south yard which was taken over by the british india steam navigation company and by uh, by 1915 the north and south yards including richi and mogul docks came under a unified control of the masgon dock company which we shall examine a bit later but this is how the masgon dock started under the p and o company now it, uh, the fame of the masgon dock and the p and o company went far and wide and we have a newspaper report from a very famous newspaper the sydney morning herald of 13 september 1862 describing the masgon dockyard it must be mentioned that the bombay dockyard which we have seen which is now the naval dockyard continued as a ship building and ship repair yard it was owned by the east india company till 1858 when along with other things the british crown took over india wide the queen uh, queen's proclamation it then serviced the various avatars of the royal navy and the indian navy so it continued uh, it continued its function of building ships till the earlier 20th century and thereafter repairing and ship refits another piece of infrastructure across the harbor was the hydraulic lift at hog island this was inaugurated on 16 september 1872 by the governor and this was capable of lifting ships for maintenance so you could uh, it would uh, go up and down powered by hydraulic engines and had a capacity of 8000 tons it could lift a weight of ships of 8000 tons so this was another facility which the p and o company used to use now the kolkata and burma steam navigation company was established in 1856 to meet the east india company's requirement of a mail service between kolkata and rangoon now two scotsmen uh, notice the names william william mackinon and robert mackenzie Uh, forming the partnership of mackinon and mackenzie guided the destiny of this company starting with just two ships the ss baltic and the ss cape of good hope the company later changed its name to the british india steam navigation company in 1862 now from 1870 to 1940 the pno steam navigation company and the british india steam navigation company operated from the north and south yards of at masgon respectively the two companies merged in 1914 and the british india steam navigation company became a part of the p and o group of companies amalgamation but continued with its own identity and organization for nearly 60 years until 1972 when it was entirely absorbed by the p and o company we this is an image of the steamship dorunda belonging to the british india steam navigation company this is lord incheb the chairman of the bnu who presided over the merger of the british india and the pno companies and this is a advertisement and the flag of the bi company now we come back to ship building at the bombay dock yeah, this was just uh, uh, what happened which company acquired the infrastructure but ship building continued at the bombay dock yeah. and it kept on building ship in the 19th century 262 ships of various descriptions sail steam hybrid were built at the bombay dockyard one of them the hcs punjab the honorable company service ship punjab was a steam paddle frigate of 10 guns built for the east india company and it was launched in 1852 the punjab displaced about 1745 tons and was powered by a 700 hp engine now she was purchased by one uh, merchant called john willis in 1862 who converted her to a sailing vessel and renamed her the tweed now we have a steam vessel 
which is converted back to a sailing vessel. The Tweed was reportedly the fastest sailing ship of her times and made several trips to Australia and China from England. On the first trip to Melbourne from England, she made the passage in 83 days, which was a record at that time and logging almost 300 nautical miles a day, sailing at a speed of an average speed of 15 knots, which is extremely fast for a sailing ship. Another big ship that was built at the Bombay dockyard was the HMS Mini or Mani. It was the last of the ships of the line. The ships of a line is a very premier battle warship of that era for the Royal Navy in Bombay dockyard. It was built in 1848. It displaced 2,600 tons. And it was the last ship of the line to be built, also the largest ship to be built at the Bombay dockyard. Originally, it was named the Madras. And what was the change to Maini to commemorate the victory of Sir Charles Napier at Maini near Hyderabad in Sindh in, 19, in 1843. Now, HMS Maini was eventually converted to a screw type propulsion in 1854 at the Chetham dockyard in England. So, this was a sailing ship which was converted to a steamship. And in the earlier example, we have seen a steamship that was converted to a sailing ship. This is a newspaper report that appeared in England in a paper called the Morning Advertiser on December 29th, 1848. It reports the launching of the Maini in the presence of Lord and Lady Falkland. Lord Falkland was the governor of Bombay in 1848 to 1853. So this also made newspaper headlines in far off newspapers of ships being built in Bombay. Now the commercial viability of steam came only when engines were greatly improved and ships were made of iron and steel. This effectively, when the technology progressed so much that you could have cost efficient ships and uh, you know economical operation of ships, this brought an end to the era of peak building and sail ships around 1884. So from the period 1736 to 1884, around 350 odd ships were built at the Bombay dockyard. But as technology changed, the sail ship era died out around 1884 and ships generally uh, began uh, being made uh, operating wholly on steam. This image shows the SS Multan, the first P&O ship with a compound engine in 1861. It had maintenance facilities in Bombay to service this ship. Now, again, as I mentioned before, nearly 60 steam ships and vessels were built at Bombay up to 1932. With this, I have uh, just give me some time. I have come to the first part of my talk. I will just change presentations. So the World War One broke out in August 1914, and within two months, over a hundred P&O ships were converted at Bombay as armed cruisers, troop ships, ambulance and hospital ships, and transport ships to assist the war effort. It must be remembered that almost 14 lakh Indian soldiers fought in World War One and they needed transportation to get them to the theater of war. Also, war logistics such as horses were bought to India from Australia and mules and camels were taken from India as part of war logistics. The first allied convoy carrying Indian troops from Bombay consisted of five BISN ships. And almost every month, convoys composed of ships of the P&O combined sailed from Bombay. And these ships were all converted to uh, these uh, troop ships at the Bombay dockyard. You can see here a camel is being loaded onto a ship. And another picture, you can see horses being loaded onto the ships to take uh, as a part of war logistics. Now, the Bombay dockyard or the, the Mazgon dock did not restrict itself to building ships. It was a, it had a foundry and some heavy engineering work was also done there. And in uh, 1928, a 13 feet full size bronze statue of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj on horseback was cast with a seven piece pattern at Masgon. This statue was sculpted by Nana Sahib Karmarkar and the statue is unveiled at the campus of Sri Shivaji Memorial Preparatory School at Pune in 1928 and it is still there. Is so anybody going to Pune can have a look of this statue which was cast in Bombay in the dockyard. The partnership of the P&O Steam Navigation Company 
and the BISN company resulted in Mascon Lock Limited getting incorporated as a public limited company. So what is today in Mascon Lock Limited became a company in 1934 by the amalgamation of these two companies. This shows the seal and the trademark uh, that was adopted at that time. And this, this was the registered office of the company. It was of the managing agents, Mrs. McKinnon and McKinsey and Company at Ballard Pier. And this building is known as the McKinnon and McKinsey building. It is a very, very famous landmark at the Ballard Pier. You can see this old advertisement of the Pier Andorra. It mentions Mrs. McKinnon and McKinsey and Company as the managing agents. So now we move on to World War II. I'm going a bit fast because I have to cover almost uh, two centuries of developments. So therefore I'll be jumping a bit. So in World War II uh, broke out in September 1935. This against once again during this period, the Mazgon Dock Limited was utilized for converting of passenger liners of the P&O fleet into troop ships, hospital ships and fitting armament on merchant ships for the allies. Uh, close to 4,678 vessels were repaired, converted and refitted during World War II at the Mascon Dock Shipyard Limited. And this was this shows the North Yard and the South Yard with the Mughal Dock. Battle damage caused by torpedo to a US Navy cruiser in operating in the Pacific Theater, the USS Boyce was successfully repaired at, the, at Bombay at the Mascon Dock Shipyard. She came with a big, gaping big hole, which old timers say was as big as a bus, but you have to leave some uh, space for exaggeration there. But a big torpedo damaged uh, hull was repaired at the Mascon Dock in World War II of a US naval warship. In 1950, the shipyard commenced manufacturing of the Campbell oil engine. So it was not restricting itself only to building ships. It also had diversified into engines under the brand name Mazdoc oil engine. The engine and pump contraption was primarily intended for agriculture use, pumping of water. And this was in great demand and was marketed till 1966. We move on to nationalization around the Mazgon dock as we have seen its journey from the P&O dockyard, from the Bombay dockyard to the P&O dockyard now to an independent company was nationalized as a public sector undertaking on 14th May 1960, when the then defense minister, Sri V.K. Krishna Menon, hoisted the tricolor and unveiled the plaque. You see the honorable defense minister in this, uh, in this photograph. And the first order to be executed by MDL after nationalization was a 50 ton hopper barge for the Indian Navy. This certificate shows the patented trademark of MDL, which we now know. Now, an interesting anecdote, Mazgon at one time was uh, home to a large number of Chinese population, most of whom worked as fitters in the dockyard. There was a thriving Chinatown in Mazagon and still to some extent exists there. Chinese were originally from Canton in South China and these people moved to India when they were working for the East India Company. They were well known for their ability to work to find tolerances, very, very delicate work with just hand tools in cramped quarters. And this particularly was useful when working on the ship itself because ships workshops in those days were quite rudimentary. However, in 1962, when the Sino-Indian War commenced, the Chinese workmen one fine day were told to leave overnight. They turned up for work and they were told that you were no longer required to work here and they were dismissed forthright. So this, uh, this episode happened in 1962. A few of the Chinese still live in, in and around the Mazgon dockyard, but most of them have migrated elsewhere. Early orders in the 1960s after nationalization were small vessels like a police launch for the Madras Port Trust, passenger ferry for Andaman administration and tug for Kandla Port Trust. And slowly as the shipyard started getting uh, experience, it started building different, different types of vessels, which I'll be covering uh, shortly. This advertisement appeared in the Reader's Digest of 1963 advertising the services of Mazgon Dock. And over the next six decades after 1960, uh, Mazgon Dock has built vessels for the Navy, Coast Guard, BSF, 
customs, port trusts of Bombay, Vizag, Madras, JNPT, Kandla, Pipaf, Tutikorin, the Dredging Corporation of India, Fisheries Authorities, Inland Waterways, Shipping Corporation of India, and shipping companies like Dempo, Salgaukar, Tolani, even overseas clients like Singapore, from Singapore, UK, Iran, Yemen, Mozambique, France, Mexico, and Norway. So you see uh, the shipbuilding activity, the Make in India initiative was very much in present first in the 18th century and again in the 20th century when ships, I'll just cover briefly what different types of ships have been built here in Bombay or Mumbai. We had uh, something called as the West Coast Consortium in 1800 and, uh, sorry, 1968. The government of India launched an all India program to modernize India's fishing, giving rise to a requirement of 40 deep sea fishing trawlers, a West Coast, West Coast consortium of shipbuilders comprising MDL, Goa Shipyard, Alcock and Ashtown, Brunton and Company and Sindhya Workshops and the Bombay Burma Trading Corporation formed a consortium to build these 40 fishing trawlers. As time passed, bigger orders came and six cargo vessels, about approximately 4,000 tons each, were built for the Goomba Shipping Company in UK. So uh, shipping companies in the United Kingdom had their ships built at Bombay in the 1970s. This shows the launch of two cargo vessels of Goomba Shipping uh, by Begum Abida Ahmed on, in 1977. Begum Abida Ahmed was the first lady of India. She was the wife of the president, Fakhruddin uh, Ali Ahmed and she launched these two ships at Bombay. MDL built the Harshwardhana for the Shipping Corporation of India in 1974. It was, it was used on the Chennai-Calcutta to Port Blair route before air traffic, air travel became a reality. So you have to, the only way to reach Port Blair was by the ship, which used to take a passage of about three to four days. Two, uh, 2,500 tons cargo carriers, the Asian Progress and the Asian Ventura were built in 1976 for a Singaporean firm. Water tanker was built for Iran. This water tanker called Taheri was exported to Iran. A cargo vessel for the US, UK, again a different company. Now, a 10-year collaboration agreement was signed in 1966, which enabled MDL to undertake construction of dredgers in India. And MDL successfully built a number of dredgers like Kichodhara for Indian Navy, Taimina for the government of Kerala, Kachwalla for Kanla port, and Vishal for the Bombay port. Now, a dredger is a particular type of vessel which is used to clear the silt that accumulates in harbors so that the harbors have to uh, maintain a specific depth for vessels. A dredger is used to maintain that depth and clear of the silt. That is a very, very specific use for this kind of vessel. The Kachwalla, which was built for the Kanla port, and over the years, a lot of ships have had refit and repairs undertaken, ranging from warships to merchantmen to different types of vessels. One of the biggest ships to be repaired here was the Alvaro de Bazan, a Danish super tanker which displaced 1,66,000 tons. The so very, very big ship, one of the biggest ships to have probably come to the Bombay port. And this was repaired at, by the Mazgon dock here in Bombay. Also, in 1960, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research came up with a challenge of manufacturing gear sectors for a radio telescope to be installed in the Nilgiri Hills. The diameter of the gearing was 35 feet, which was more than what any firm could handle at that time. So these gear sectors were also built at the Mazgon Dock shipyard for this radio telescope. Also, Large gearing for the first revolving restaurant in India which at the textile market in Surat were manufactured in that dockyard. So you see different types of jobs that were undertaken. Again, uh, in 1981, the MDL travels back through time when the shipyard was called upon to build the sail training ship Varuna for the Sea Cadet Corps. The ship was commissioned in 1981 and many used for training of sea cadets and sea cadet uh, also naval cadets. This is the building of a multi-purpose supply vessel. This was built for a 
client in Mexico and one client in Norway. So this also export orders happened in very recently in 2012 and 14. In the, in the late 1970s, the shipyard diversified into offshore structures. Offshore structures are used in the hydrocarbon industry. And the first offshore platform was delivered to ONGC in 1979. If you can see a few familiar faces, that is Sri N.D. Tiwari and Sri H.N. Bauguna, who had come at the launch or the inauguration function. And in total, 64 offshore structures were built at Bombay. And MDL was the undisputed market leader in India in this segment in the 1970s, 80s, and even up to the 90s. So with this, we have completed the part about the merchant marine, the various ships which were built for the merchant marine at Bombay. I shall now move on to the next part of the talk, which is about the warships and submarines that were built at Bombay. So now we move on to the next segment, which is the construction of warships that has happened in Bombay and continues to happen so far. So the first warship of the modern era to be constructed for the Indian Navy was the INS Batkal. It was an inshore minesweeper constructed in 18, 1968. Now, the, a sweeper has a special wooden construction. The, wool, the hull is made of wood and laminated with fiberglass. This is because it is used to clear mines which, have, which detect a magnetic signature of a ship. So the magnetic signature is suppressed to a large extent and the hull is uh, constructed from wood and non-ferrous or non-magnetic materials. The first warship in India was the INS Batkal, constructed in 1968. Now, modern warship construction was ushered in with the Leander project in the late 1960s in partnership with the Yarrow Shipyard of England. These were the, the most modern ships of that era. They were famed the Leander, the Leander class all over uh, the world. The Royal Navy and most of the Commonwealth navies had this type of ship. These were steam propelled frigates displacing 2,800 tons with anti-aircraft and anti-submarine capability. They also carried a helicopter and to a total of uh, six Leander class frigates were built by MDL. They were the Nilgiri, Himgiri, Dunagiri, Taragiri, Udaygiri and Vindyagiri, named after mountain ranges in India. Uh, the first one was Nilgiri and the last of the Leander was Vindyagiri. And I can proudly say I've served on both of them or Nilgiri as well as Vindyagiri. So 23rd October 1968 was a watershed day when Srimati Indira Gandhi, the Honorable Prime Minister, launched the first ship of the project, INS Nilgiri. So you, here you see Nilgiri, the launching ceremony is when the ship's hull enters the water for the first time. It is a very, very ceremonial event and well celebrated. And this was an important milestone and well celebrated throughout the country. Here's a first day cover issued by the PNT department showing Nilgiri. And uh, even the Maharaja got into the act, the famous advertisement issued by our uh, Air India on when Nilgiri was launched. INS Nilgiri was commissioned in 1972 on 3rd, 3rd of June again by the Prime Minister Srimati Indira Gandhi. And you see the young um, lieutenant in the picture. He, is, he later on went on to become Admiral Madhvendra Singh, the Chief of the Naval Staff. But at that time, the Officer of the Guard was the then Lieutenant Madhvendra Singh. The uh, rich experience in the 70s gained, uh, you know, in the Leander project, uh, uh, then led to the construction of the uh, Godavari class. Now, this was a, another landmark because the Godavari class was entirely designed by Indians in India and you did not have to depend upon foreign designs. Now, I'll just like to add a, moment, a bit that the Leanders were designed of 60s and 70s and the Godavari class came in the 80s. Now, ship building technology or warship building technology changes once in every 10 years. So, we'll, I'll just take you through the decades and you can notice how the ships, the looks, the designs change every 10 years. The Godavari class was built in the 19, uh, 19, late 19, uh, early 1980s. Godavari was commissioned in 83, Ganga was commissioned in 85 and Gomti in 88. The Godavari class was bigger than the Leander class. They displaced 3,600 tons armed with guided missiles and could carry two helicopters instead of one. 
and the like i said these were the first indigenously de designed warships again they were steam propelled a, a different another ship mdl built the ins thief which was commissioned in 1986 and many and this was used as a training ship where all naval officers learned the ropes and found their sea legs on board the vessel it was powered by ic engine so now the technology has shifted from steam to internal combustion or diesel engines in the 80s mdl built two corvettes the corvette is a slightly smaller ship than a frigate the ins kukri and the ins kuthar and also outfitted ins kirch whose hull was built at grc or calcutta garden rich ship builders and engineer these ships again were designed totally by the indian navy and this particular image shows the kukri being launched in september 1985 by mrs sudha mulla the wife of captain mahendranath mulla who was the commanding officer of the ins kukri in the 1971 war you know that ins kukri was sunk by by a torpedo hit in the 1971 war and uh, captain mulla went down with the ship but sudha mrs sudha mulla was invited to launch the second reincarnation of ins kukri four vibhuti class missile boats were built at mdl under the license from ussr in the 90s in the in the 90s vibhuti 1991 ins vipul 92 ins nashak 94 and ins prabal 2002 these were extremely fast boats powered by gas turbine so now technology has shifted from steam to diesel to ic engines to gas turbine engines and these extremely small boats carried guided missiles four of them were built at bombay dock bombay uh, six offshore patrol vessels or opvs as they were known were built for the coast guard the first cgs vikram was commissioned in uh, december 1983 so coast guard also got the ships built here we move on to submarine construction a submarine construction is one of the most complex heavy engineering activities and this graph shows you the level of complexity involved in submarine constructions it is more complex than even constructing a fighter jet or a passenger liner or even warship uh, it's right at the top of the graph and uh, the masgon dock and bombay is the only shipyard in india which has the capacity to build and construct submarines Uh, this these images are just for representational purposes they don't show any submarine but this is what a inside of a submarine looks like it's very very tightly packed very very you know space is at a premium once again we have the prime minister shrimati indira gandhi inaugurating the construction of submarines in uh, may 1984 at bombay at the masgon dock and uh, in partnership with hdw of germany mdl has constructed two ssk submarines ssk which stands for submarine to submarine killers for the indian navy ins shalki was commissioned on uh, february 1992 and ins shankul was commissioned in may 94 so you see this is what a submarine looks like outside the water this is what it looks like inside the water so two submarines were constructed this is uh, these are floating border outpost nine floating border outposts were capable of operating shallow water with accommodation for personal weapons ammunition and speed boats were constructed for the border security force or the bsf and they were deployed to guard the brahmaputra basin and the ran of kutch moving on ins nirikshak a diving support vessel for the indian navy was built in 1987 it provides support it acts as a mothership to divers deep sea divers who are employed in uh, various activities by the navy popularly called the delhi class the ships this ship was built in the late 1990s and at that time was the biggest the largest warships to be built in india they carried weaponry for air surface and sub surface roles and propelled by gas turbines so we are now the technology has changed to gas turbines capable of speeds up to 30 knots and carried two helicopters ins delhi was commissioned in 97 ins mysore in 99 and ins mumbai in uh, 2001 the delhi class has made its mark as the among the best warships in the world 
and has uh, proved itself all in various theaters all over the world. The first day cover issued for the first anniversary of INS Delhi. Now, technology changed once again in the early and the first decade of the new millennium with the arrival of building of the Shivalik class stealth frigate. Uh, a stealth frigate is a, uh, is a ship which has a very low radar cross section. It cannot be easily detected by the enemy. Its infrared exposure is low. Magnetic signature is suppressed. Underwater noise and vibration are suppressed. So all these are uh, have a peculiar, a ship has a signature which is detected by guided missiles and other uh, incoming armament. So a stealth frigate is one not very easy to detect. It's got a very, very low signature, making it very difficult for the enemy to detect. And only a few handful of countries in the world have the technology and the capability to build stealth ships. India is one of them. The INS Shivalik was the first stealth ship to be commissioned in 2010. This was followed by the INS Satpura in 2011 and the INS Sayadri in 2012. So these are the very state-of-the-art stealth frigates which have been built at Bombay. Moving on to the Scorpion submarines, which is made in collaboration with DCNS, now Naval Group, a French company using transfer of technology. These are, these are six diesel electric submarines that are under construction and mass gone dock, out of which two INS Calvary was commissioned into the Navy in 2017 and the INS Khanderi commissioned in 2019. Other four are still under construction at various stages of construction. So like I said, Masgon Dock Shipbuilders is the only shipyard in India which has the capability to build submarines. The Kolkata class or the 15 Project 15 Alpha. Now, after the Delhi class, this is the largest warship in India other than the aircraft carrier, which is not yet commissioned. But the Kolkata class is the largest warship built. It displaces 7,500 tons. And it uses a COGAG, C-O-G-A-G, -G, combined gas and gas propulsion. So again, it, the technology of propulsion has changed. It is improved to a combination of two gas turbines. And it has a 70% indigenization component, this particular class of ship. That means 70% of the ship is made in India, uh, other than the weapons which have to be imported. This is a 15 Bravo, which is still under construction. The ships are called Vishakapatnam, Marmagao, and Imphal. They have not yet been launched. Various stages of out, out, um, outfitting. And the last project is the Project 17 Alpha, which comprises four ships to be built at MDL and three ships to be built at GRC Kolkata. This is the follow-on of the Shivali class frigates uh, with improvements. And this shows the launching of the Nilgiri, the the old Nilgiri has retired. You saw the image of the launching of Nilgiri. And the first, uh, this was launched on 30th September 2019. I'll just show you a small clip uh, when the ship is launched. She enters the water for the first time. It's a very ceremonial occasion. It is purely by gravity that the ship moves from the uh, slipway into the water. And I was there, I had the privilege to be present when the Nilgiri was launched and also I have served on the first old Nilgiri. There she goes into the water. There we are. Now, this project utilizes a very new modern methodology of ship construction, which is called integrated construction. This involves construction of pre-outfitted modules or blocks with all equipment, systems, piping, ventilation, trunkings in blocks, which are then integrated on the slipway. Now, this reduces the overall build period as they are uh, built at various places and assembled like a like a Lego model or a jigsaw puzzle, it all comes together at the shipway. So this is a new method of construction that has been employed for this type of ship. Now, uh, With this, I finished uh, my talk today. We have covered roughly 190 years from, um, from the advent of the first steam propelled ship to the present day. And all this is captured in the heritage gallery Darohar, which is there in Mazgon Dock Shipbuilder, which captures the era of sail, the era of steam to modern ships this is the curatorial team that put together the road which i was a part of 
and it was inaugurated by the then defense minister shri manohar parikar and the upgraded upgraded version of the rover was inaugurated last year by shri rajnath singh the honorable defense minister and i would like to acknowledge in my talk the various references which i have utilized we have darohar i got inputs from the royal maritime museum greenwich the british library the bombay dockyard and wadia master builders by ratan ji adarshi wadia the coffee table books of the mdl and the warship overseeing team the 100 year history of the pno by boyd gable shri mohan khare of ra arts and communication and mr abhishek day of maitrika design studio thank you very much i have finished my talk for today and would be happy to take questions thank you very much nenad it's like sitting in a time machine and seeing all the various vessels but tell me one thing you you've had rightly focused on mazgan dock that's the place where you sort of your career was there ever any ship building activity at the bombay dock the ones which we know now as the bombay dockyard as the, yes yes like i mentioned the naval dockyard continued building ships till the 1930s okay. and it was uh, since it is the information what happened there not in the public domain uh -huh. you know what happened so it's part of the naval dockyard so it is not in the public domain that's why i could not focus on what i but it is mainly uh, it engages in ship repair and maintenance of the naval fleet and even now yes yes very much okay so the bombay dock the duncan dock they're all there <laughs> uh, uh can, can people use the terms dockyard and shipyard synonymously the question was why is cochin a shipyard and bombay a dockyard it's it's interchangeable it's uh... it's interchangeable uh i think we need to go back to your very first few slides the question was in connection with is there a limit to how much tonnage a ship can have can you build ships as large as possible or is there a point where a it's not feasible to float so it all depends on the uh, role of the ship so we have the merchant marine which are in excess of uh, 2 lakh tons we saw one image which i showed so they are designed for carrying oil in mm -hmm. bulk so the bigger the ship the harder it becomes to maneuver it so that is one point uh, the may i mention here uh, uh, nina that the largest ship was owned by an indian who oh. was uh, one mr tikku and he built a oil cargo what's called a very large cargo carrier of 450000 tons and the his company's name was globetik tankers so that was the privilege of a indian entrepreneur this was in the late 50s 1950s. thank you thank you indrush but they, but there after uh, the ships are now generally under uh, 300 300000 tons 250000 tons is the largest ship nowadays which is because it's practical because it's of the it is to do with the suez canal and the panama canal and uh, the uh, draft in the Malacca Straits. These are the uh, global restrictions on the size of a ship. Otherwise, there is no theoretically there is no limit. Thank you, Indrushil. Moving on to our questions, you met, you showed an image of a vessel called the Punjab, which was converted from uh, uh, steam, steam to sail. sail. What would have been the rationale? It was a privately owned vessel, so the main rationale. Uh, Uh, i would say motive would be speed it was converted more of a clipper so you see lots and lots of sails and it gave 15 knots speed at which was phenomenal for a wind power ship uh -huh. so so the rationale would have been speed otherwise then it's uh, the whims and fancy of the owner i would say okay and there was a contrast story so to speak uh, So, what was the story behind the sailing ship being a recent sailing ship which was built so in the, the many, 1980s? Many was a, a sail ship. So, as technology advanced, they started getting fitted with propellers mm -hmm. to propel them. So, the, though the uh, with boilers, steamship. Mm -hmm. So, the reliability increases. You are not subject to the vagaries of nature as a steamship. Mm -hmm. So, that would be the reliability factor when you get an engine. It is at your beck and call. Okay. and um, uh, nikhil wants to know in terms of capacity production how is mdl placed vis-a-vis cochin and garden reach capacity means uh, the number of ships uh, i think he's talking about the production capacity how much it is capable of producing 
So presently we saw, as I mentioned, there are three projects going on there. And I think MDL has the capacity to work on about uh, uh, 10 to 12 projects simultaneously. Simultaneously, okay. Which is uh, much more than Garden Reach and Cochin Shipyard. Cochin Shipyard has the biggest dry dock because it is building the aircraft carrier, but Cochin Shipyard mainly caters to the mercantile marine. It is under the Ministry of Shipping. Mm -hmm. And it, NASCON dock comes under the Ministry of Defense, which caters primarily to the Indian Navy. Okay, so that answers Nikhil's next question about the legal, legal status of MDL. Uh, he also wanted to request you to give us short, uh, in which decades did the change or change overtake place from wind to steel? So the wind, the first steel ship came around 90, uh, sorry, steam. Steam ship came around yeah. 19, uh, 1829. I would say the steel hulls came around the 1860s. Okay. And so when would the uh, when would it have moved from diesel to gas turbines? So diesel was uh, diesel powered ships were uh, I mean in uh, vogue in the mercant marine they were there since uh, propulsion started in 1940s 50s but gas turbines would have come in in the 1980s and 90s. Okay. And uh, nuclear power. Nuclear power is much later, again in the 90s, though India does have nuclear powered submarine, but that is uh, another topic. Okay, and uh, Nikhil is curious to know which are the countries with which MDL has technical collaborations? Right now, only uh, France for uh, uh, building of the submarines, the Scorpion uh -huh. project, but the equipment which the Navy sources and which uh, which are fitted on Indian warships come from countries as diverse as Israel, Germany, uh, Russia, England. So there are various whole smorgasbord of mm -hmm, companies. Mm -hmm. um, so that Nikhil's question on whether it's a PSU is uh, answered. Um, <clears throat> collaborations you mentioned. Yes. Um, Indrashil says that he traveled uh, from Bombay to Tilbury on a ship called the SS Multan. And he's wondering if that is the same SS Multan which you showed in your slide. The, the Multan which I showed is uh, of 1861 vintage. So I doubt whether uh, Admiral uh, Rao, uh, actually he's uh, Admiral Indrashil Rao and he was one time heading the Bombay dockyard. So just for perspective. <laughs> nice to know. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, Ninar, for pointing it out. And so, sir, I don't to... think it was the same Multan. That was the image was of 1861. Right. Admiral also points out that uh, Commandant Mortonall, a dredger, was built by MDL, uh, by MDL in 1999 for export to the West Indies, and it came through a French consortium represented by BHP. Yes. Uh, who was, which was owned by a former naval officer. So that's his observation. Uh, typical question which happens at all these talks, what books can I read to know more about Bombay shipbuilding industry? I think you've covered a few in your last slide. Yes. So how can Kaizad read more about uh, the Bombay docks? So there are certain uh, coffee table books uh, which have been published. Uh, which I mentioned, the Mazgon Dock has got a coffee table book. I've got a copy with me, the Warship Over thing. So a lot of these, these are meant for public consumption, which are published by these organizations, which, uh, you know, do not give too much of classified information out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, there are a host of coffee. The Port Trust has a coffee table book. The Dockyard, Naval Dockyard has many coffee table books. The Indian Navy has got lots of coffee table books where you can get all this history. So it's more of, uh, you have to get hold of all these books. Okay. Um, Commander Mohan Narayan points out sail to steam and timber to steel was the fallout of the Industrial Revolution. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you Commander. Uh, a repeated question, is Darohar open to the public? I'm keen to see it. Hmm. So, uh, unfortunately, you just can't walk into Darohar. You have to take special permission, which can be arranged if for uh, tours. So we do take uh, from the Maritime Mumbai Museum Society, we do organize trips. So we would be happy to arrange a visit to Darohar through the Museum Society. 
Um, the que my question was about the Wadias. I mean, when we talk about the Bombay shipyard, you refer to the Wadias, the forerunner, the front runner. Till when did the Wadia family play an important role in shipbuilding in Mumbai? 1884. So okay. seven generations of Wadias uh, were appointed as uh, the master builders or the head naval architects at the Bombay dockyard, starting with Lauji Nasarwanji in 1730. You know, he, he came as a foreman from Surat and later on, I think by 1750 or 60, he became the master builder there. And they were all employees of the East India Company and uh, they made a name for themselves. So seven generations worked as builders, last of them in 1884. We do have a descendant of that family in our audience, Dr. Farag Wadia. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so we yeah. have the entire family tree of the Wadia starting from Lauji, which is yes. there in Dharohar, which is displayed there right up to 1950. Uh, I do believe I've seen it in the Bombay Dockyard little museum, which is yes. just inside the gate. Yeah. Okay. Could be. Could be. So I think just the last question: Is the surname Wadia anything to do with the profession of shipbuilding? Yes, it it derives it from Wadia V A D I A. It started out there, which means a carpenter or engaged in the profession of shipbuilding. So they adopted this name sometime in the late 18th century. At that time, as you know. Surnames were not utilized by Parsis. They used a combination of their name and their father's name. But Wadia was adopted sometime in the late uh, 18th century. It means a person engaged in carpentry or shipbuilding. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. That was really fascinating. Like I said, uh, when uh, you finished your talk, it was like sitting in a small time machine and going across. Thank you all the the high powered individuals who are there in the audience. Uh, do keep on attending as many of our talks as possible. Uh, see you soon and have a good night.